LVC, I'm honored once again to come with you to the Lord's table to celebrate and to mark what our Savior has done, to give his life as a ransom for many. So in these first two chapters of our, our series on the Gospel of Luke, we're looking at how Jesus came into the temple and had this showdown with the religious leaders. See, what they failed to understand was that he was coming to replace that temple system And I can imagine Jesus standing in this temple as the Son of God who shows in this body, in this life, who God is. You can see over there in that curtain, behind that curtain, where the Ark of the Covenant is, is where the Holy of Holies resides. And that's where the presence of God has been dwelling with His people for thousands of years. And yet here He is in the flesh. And He would give that flesh, give that body to be sacrificed on a Roman cross for all of those listening and for you and me, all those who would ever turn and repent and trust him as their savior and their Lord. You see, because what happened is when he died on that cross, that curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. And now we have access because of Jesus Christ. We have access to God completely, that we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when we come to the Lord's table and celebrate what we call the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion, see, we mark the fact, we commemorate the fact that He gave His life for us. And now for all those who have the Holy Spirit living inside of us because of that gift, we come now and we say, Lord, we remember your body. We remember your blood. And Jesus says, I'm going to send my spirit to be in you. And the Holy Spirit comes upon these disciples. And what Luke writes next in the the, the book of Acts, and he dwells with us. Our God is with us. And so even now, 2,000 years later, church, when we celebrate this sacrament, there is this mysterious way in which the Holy Spirit comes powerfully to seal in our hearts what this means. That these are not just mere crackers or bread or grape juice or whatever you're using, by the way, during this pandemic. They don't actually become his body or his blood. But it's so much more than just a memorial because his Holy Spirit is poured out in our hearts to say that we are his. We are his children. And so now in view of all that, church, let's come before this holy and merciful God and confess our sins corporately together. You can say this along with me. Holy and merciful God, we acknowledge that we are under your authority. Yet we confess that too often we have spurned your authority and pursued our own agenda. We confess that we have sinned against you. We have done what we want to do instead of what you want us to do. We have lacked the faith to believe that with your authority comes true goodness. You desire to heal our hearts, and yet we have sought other paths of healing. Lord, you are the God whose heart goes out to the sinful, broken, and hurting. Please forgive us and heal us in Jesus' name. Amen. So sister or brother in Christ, if you said that prayer of confession with a sincere heart, know that you have been forgiven, that he loves you. Know the freedom of his grace today. Well now, church, before we partake of the elements, why don't you take just about 30 seconds to examine your heart before the Lord. So church, then on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the Apostle Paul tells us that he took bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my 
body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread together. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's take the cup together. Amen. And he said that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, the gifts of God, LVC, for the people of God. Let's receive it with thanksgiving and let's pray. Well, Lord, indeed we give thanks. We cannot thank you enough. And Lord, I pray that where we lack the gratitude, would you fill our hearts so much with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we would stand in awe once again of what you've done for us to reconcile rebels like me to a holy God because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Lord, would you seal in our hearts this meal that we've taken together. Thank you for all of your gifts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Lavington Vineyard Church. And to those of you tuning in for the first time, welcome. My name is Jeremy. I serve as one of the pastors of LVC. Have you ever had an experience where you completely missed the point? We've all seen others missing the point and we tend to notice that pretty well. But how about you? Has there been a time where, because you didn't understand what was being said, you just completely missed a key part of the discussion, or you just kind of found yourself clueless? You found that you completely missed the point. So today, as we get back in our series in the Gospel of Luke, we're going to look at this epic case of missing the point that has huge implications because of how religious leaders, the leaders of Israel, completely miss who Jesus is. Well, we're also going to take a look at how, given a particular passage of Scripture that may be very familiar to you, that's used quite a bit by pastors and other teachers, how people often miss the point and miss what's happening in this section of Luke's gospel. So church, I'm going to do a bit of an experiment this morning. I'm going to try preaching without notes. Now I have my my passage in front of me. In fact, I have it here with my my favorite colored pencils. I've marked up the text and I've looked at all my the, the flow and the structure of the text and all of my key words. It's a method that I've taught Our kids, Tamara and I learned this in the Christian Union in university. And so I've got the text in front of me, but I'm going to try preaching without notes. And it's a great opportunity because some circumstances arose this week that are allowing me to do this. Now, just as a little bit of an aside, for most of my four and a half years pastoring LVC, I've used different formats. I've tried different things in this first five years, just trying out different methods of preaching. And so one has been preaching a full manuscript where essentially whatever I say has been written down. You may not know that I'm essentially reading a manuscript, but I have been at times. Other times I have a full outline. Other times I have just one page of notes, a very, very rough, brief outline. So I'm going to try this. There are some preachers who say, who just swear by this method. Uh, Other ones say, no way, do a full manuscript. So preachers are all over the map on this. So I'm going to give this a try. Please feel free to give me feedback. I'd love to hear what you think. If you just think, Jeremy, you lost me. Um, That was rubbish. (laughs) Just go back to more notes. Or maybe you say, ah, I didn't notice much of a difference. Or you say, hey, um, that seemed to work well. Whatever the case, let me know. But I'm going to try this out and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to help me take this ancient text and bridge the context to where we are in 2021. So this is how we're going to start. We're going to start actually at the end of our passage. We're, going to, we're in Luke chapter 20, verse 19 to chapter 21, verse 4. And instead of reading it all the way through, we're going to look at the very end. And I'm going to show you this familiar 
passage. And after I read it, we're going to kind of work our way back and work our way through the text in different ways. But as I read this short little text, I want you to stop and think, even as I read along, how do you normally understand this passage? How have you heard it taught before? So this is in chapter 21 of Luke's Gospel, verses 1 to 4. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. So we're going to look at these four short verses. And I'm wondering, how have you heard this taught? How have you understood this passage? Now, as we're going to get into it, you're going to see how in the context, there's a different understanding. But see, what happens is often we take a small passage like this, and just in isolation, we jump to application or contextualization, saying we've got to jump so fast from just what it says plainly or what I think it says plainly to then what it means for our lives. But see, I think, I mi- I think people miss what happens plainly in this text, given what's around it given the context. So, I bet for most of us, the way we've heard this taught is that it's about giving, right? The widow's offering, the widow's might. So, it's at least one of three ways you've heard this taught. One is that there's just this relative comparison between the two relative gifts. So, you have the rich, the wealthy, given out of, giving out of their wealth, right? It's kind of like that Hollywood movie star, who can make $20 million in one film, and then they give $1 million to, let's say, Save Elephants or some other charity, and we're supposed to applaud them for that. Like, bravo, you gave $1 million out of your tens of millions of dollars that you make per year. So, in a similar way, these wealthy, these leaders have it kind of splashed all over the news. They love to be noticed for things like this. So some would say, well, it's just this relative comparison. Because Jesus is saying, compared to them, this widow gave a lot. She gave everything. Well, then others might say, well, no. There's this general principle of generosity. That's what we need to get from this. That we see her example and we take from it, okay, maybe we don't have to give everything, every last coin, but at least sacrificial generosity. Well, then others, perhaps more extreme, would say, no, we need to literally follow her example and give away everything. Take a complete vow of poverty. Now, look, I understand why we would take these four short verses and want to make this jump to this application. Now, because let me just say very honestly, as preachers, I could see the practical, pragmatic reason why preachers why leaders in the church want to hone in on a passage like this and make it primarily about giving. But see, I don't think it's about giving really at all. I'm not alone in this. This is not unique to me. But I am in the minority because the, the, the traditional and nearly universal understanding, interpretation, and application of this text is that it's about giving. Now, I think it's so radical to the point where We're not even meant to admire this poor widow. Now, does she show dependence? Perhaps. Probably. But that's not why this text is here. Now, I'll say a little little bit more about this as we go on. But now what I want us to do is we're going to zoom out the camera a bit. Not not literally, Martin. We're going to zoom out the camera a bit and see what comes before this. So, this is from chapter 20, verse 45. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples. Now stop right there. Before we go on to these next three verses, let's think about what they were listening to. Let's understand what they were listening to. So going back a bit even more, we're going to rewind the tape a bit, if you will, to verse 41. Then Jesus said to them, and these are the teachers of the law, and there's the crowd in the temple 
listening as he's been there having this showdown. And he said to them, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? So now, in a way, given what's happening in this passage, in this, these scenes in the temple, they've been throwing riddles, so to speak, at Jesus. They've been trying to trap him. And now he's coming back at them, using Scripture to try to, once again, once again give them this opportunity to understand his identity. Well, they end up not getting it at all. They continue to not get it. But essentially what he's saying here is that the Messiah The king who is to come, the chosen one, is the Lord, and that is him. That's the point here. Quoting Psalm 110, Jesus is making the point once again that he is the Lord. He is the Messiah. And so then he comes with this authority to interpret the scripture, scriptures that they have completely misunderstood or misinterpreted, misused, and abused. So now, while all the people are listening to this, Notice what Luke says here. Jesus says to his disciples. So he's turning his focus, his attention to the crowd once again, and specifically to his disciples. Now all the religious leaders are still hearing this. And he says this, verse 46. Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes. and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. And have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows. You notice that key word. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. So, the strongest charge yet. Jesus is throwing down the gauntlet in this showdown in the temple. This is the point of no return. The strongest words yet against these teachers of the law. And they do these four things. They walk around in flowing robes. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. They have the most important seats in the synagogue. You think of in our modern day, the preachers who love to sit up on the platform, on the stage with the famous evangelist. And then they love the places of honor at the banquets. So not only this, not only are they hypocritical and they are trying to make a show, they are just religious posturing, but then verse 47, listen to this and then consider the part about the widow's offering. They, the teachers of the law, devour widows' houses and for a show make make lengthy prayers. Now you see, in the Mosaic Law, the most basic role of these leaders, the very basis of religion, as James says, following on from the Hebrew Scriptures, is to care for orphans and widows. You see, not only are they not caring for widows, they are devouring widows' houses. Now, you see, then when we come to chapter 21 and this is where in our modern bibles we need to pay attention because see we it's convenient it's it's right that we have in our modern bibles editors have given us these chapters and verse numbers we've had this for hundreds of years it helps us refer to the bible helps us have bible study but see one of the the challenges with that is we we can tend to jump into a new chapter and read the text in isolation without thinking at all what's just come before it because it's still clearly all part of the same scene. You could just open up your print Bible or on your device and look at it. Because this is still continuing from what he's just said. And so now Jesus is sitting there and he looks up. And you can imagine that after these confrontations in the temple, Jesus may be feeling dejected, just really sad, angered. At the fact that they completely missed the point about who he is and what their role should be as Israel's leaders. 
So we can assume he's looking down because it says verse 1, chapter 21, he looked up. He happens to see the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow. So Luke highlights the fact that she's a poor widow. Jesus then says, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. So you may be wondering, why, right, Jeremy, what do you think this is about? See, I don't think this is about giving at all. I don't think that's the point of why it's here. This is a text where Jesus is saying, this system, this corrupt religious system surrounding the temple is so broken, it is so unjust, that it has to come down. And we're going to see next week, in the rest of chapter 21, how literally he prophesies that this temple structure will literally come down one day. This system is being replaced by the new covenant. And it's not just that even this temple system that God set up will be replaced, but leaders, corrupt religious leaders, have so corrupted the system that Jesus is now angry. And I think he highlights this thing that he sees right there in the temple, and he points it out to people to say, this is an indication, this is a, a demonstration of how unjust and evil this system is that a poor widow would think that she needs to give her last two coins you see i think if you look closely even just at verses one to four there is no indication at all that jesus is highlighting for moralistic or normative reasons what this poor widow is doing There's no indication at all. He's not saying there's this principle now of giving. I mean, think about it. He's had these confrontations with these religious leaders. He now rebukes them and condemns them point blank. In a few short verses, he's going to go on to talk about the destruction of the temple. Now, do we really think that he paused for a second and say, okay, and now a teaching on giving? No, that makes no sense. So, I would encourage us to look at this afresh. And let me just be really honest. Speaking as a pastor, as a preacher myself, I can understand why preachers have wanted to take this text and use it to talk about giving. Because we have these visions, these strategies. We have a vision and mission for our churches. And we want to see people cared for. We want to see the mission of the church go forward. And there's times where we've seen difficult gaps in giving. Our budgets can struggle at times. But see, let me just square with you, church. I don't want us to ever misuse and abuse even texts like this for the purposes of compelling you to give. See, because on one hand, we don't need this passage to encourage believers in Jesus to give generously. There are plenty of other passages in the New Testament alone to encourage giving to the vision and mission of the church. Well, this is not one of them. So, church, we never want to do that as a church body. We want to come before you when there's times where we have a deficit, when giving has been low, to just come and set before you the reality and then just encourage you to go before God with the principles in the New Testament of intentionality, generosity, and joy, which definitely we find in the New Testament. And can I just tell you as a a quick little uh, infomercial that we want to praise God for your generosity. Because at the end of the year, you heard me share there in front of my Christmas tree that we were facing a 2.3 million deficit. We know that this time of COVID, this pandemic has been challenging. And we've seen God be faithful. We've had some ups and downs in the giving. And we were having some down months as we approached the end of 2020. But then, praise God, we saw by the end of 2020, there was giving of 3.9 million shillings to where we ended up a pandemic year with a 1.6 million surplus. Praise God. And thank you. Thank you for the way you stepped up. Thank you for your generosity, church. But you see, we need to, as a church... It's just going to be very plain about uh, our financial picture and very open and transparent uh, and not come before you to cajole you or try to manipulate you. 
You see, if we took a passage like this and misused it, we just even maybe innocently misinterpreted it for those purposes, we would then be missing out on the power of what this text is about. And that is that Jesus is addressing an injustice. That a poor widow like this would actually think she needs to give up her last two coins. I mean, think about it. Are we really supposed to take from this text that every Christian should just give away everything? Because, I mean, if we're really going to take this at face value, that's the logical, literal implication. But that would make no sense in light of the rest of Scripture. Because if, if Christians just gave away all of their money, we would then become dependent upon society, upon the government, and would completely misunderstand teaching in the Word about stewardship. Well, we need to move on, but that's not the point of this short passage. And if you have any questions about it, feel free to talk to me. If you want to push back, I'm happy to talk about how we understand the word. So the reason why I wanted to start here and camp here a bit and talk about it so seriously and so directly is because I think it helps to unlock the meaning of the rest of the passage. Because remember, we are in this showdown in the temple. Last week, as we restarted this series in Luke, Jesus, the king, has come into his temple. He has been welcomed and acknowledged as the king. He weeps over the city because he knows the city will reject him as king, knows it will reject his authority. And when he comes in, he has this showdown in the temple. So last week was round one with the religious leaders. So now we come to the beginning of our passage this week, which is chapter 20, verse 19. And it says, The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. Now, this was a parable about the tenants, saying how God would take the, 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 the kingdom, so to speak, away from the tenants and give it to others because they had killed not only the prophets, but now the beloved son of the owner. So they realize he's spoken this against them. They're looking for a way to arrest him. So then we come to verse 20. And Luke writes this, Keeping a close watch on him, they, this is the teachers of the law and the chief priests, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription are on it? Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. So this passage is always struck me in many ways as humorous. Now, it's very serious because what they are bringing is indeed a potentially huge trap because now they are bringing in politics. They are oppressed by the Roman Empire. If he answers the wrong way, he could be guilty of insurrection, rebellion, and executed by the Romans and just, boom, their their problem would be solved. But if he says it's right to pay taxes... Then the people, he's he's become this rock star among the people, welcomed into Jerusalem as this new king. See, and they hate the Romans. They're the oppressors. So if he appears to side with the Romans, then he could lose favor with the people and maybe even be lynched by them. Now, as we come into this, this is the second showdown. This is overall showdown in the temple, but this is the second time where they send people to try and trap him. Made me think of uh, in this Marvel Comics film, X-Men, where Wolverine, who's just one of these uh, mutant characters, 
He finds himself making money by fighting in a cage. He's in cage matches in this remote part of, of uh, North America. And just huge guy after huge guy will come into this cage to try and fight him. And each one loses. Now, what they don't know is Wolverine has the strongest metal on earth all through his body. And so even though these huge burly guys will come in and tower over him and think they can just crush him, they get crushed by Wolverine. And so it's a completely unfair fight. And so time after time, well, here time after time, they're just sending people one after another, it seems, to try and match Jesus. Now, it might almost seem a bit unfair because he is the son of God, God in the flesh. But see, a deeper issue is they fail to recognize him. They have these opportunities. In fact, him engaging them at all in these fights, so to speak, these verbal battles, gives them an opportunity to respond. It's like this measure of grace that he shows to these corrupt leaders to still engage with them. And they continue to miss who he is. So in one sense, it seems like an unfair battle. And yet they try and trap him. And this is a pretty good opportunity. Well, see, Jesus hears this question and he's not having it. Now, it looks like they're going to have him trapped because earlier, see, they're upset because they try to trap him. And they ask him this question about John the Baptist and and authority. And he responds to their question with a question. And then they have no idea how to answer. They're talking amongst themselves. They they just have no idea how they're going to respond. And Jesus says, okay, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Well, so now they've come up with a really good question. But verse 23, he saw through their duplicity. The ESV translation says craftiness. They are crafty. And he says to them, okay, all right. Show me the coin. Show me the denarius. Now, what happens here is amazing. It's profound. And it leads to the point where they are astonished by his answer and they become silent. And they exit the stage because they have no idea what to do. And simply what he did is he took this coin and he said, all right, whose image is on it? And whose inscription? Well, obviously Caesar's. And see, the way that he astonishes them with his answer is he's getting them to see that, you see, if Caesar's image is on it, fine, go ahead, give it to him. And the implication when he says give to God what is God's is that people bear the image of God. Caesar may be able to put his image, his inscription on a coin. Who cares? So what? Big deal. Give it to him. But people bear the image of God. Give to God What is God? You see, as we've seen in this text, they are neglecting the people, even devouring the most vulnerable and marginalized. And Jesus is highlighting the importance of people over money. So yes, in many ways, this is about money. You could say in one sense, Jesus is saying, look, you're trying to trap me with politics, especially money. Look, in one sense, money is irrelevant. I wonder about for us in 2021, How much relevance does money have in your life? Now look, that may sound crazy to you that I'm even asking that question. Of course, money has relevance. We live in the real world. We use money to buy stuff, to get stuff, to pay people for things. We get salaries. We've got to live using this medium of money. But I wonder whether because you love money and you have quite a bit of it, whether because you don't have enough that you put so much relevance into money that you fail to see the larger relevance of people who bear God's image. Maybe you say, Jeremy, I put so much relevance on money because people are relevant to me and I've got to have money to care for people. Look, I understand that. But is it possible that you are putting so much relevance onto money? could I ask you to consider the higher question, the bigger question of the relevance of people in your life who bear the image of God. So, like I said, they try to trap him. Uh, they, they can't. They're astonished by his answer and they become silent. 
Well, now, now we have these, um, who are they? The spies who exit the stage. And this made me think of, uh, you know, East Africa's Got Talent or American Idol or Britain's Got Talent, where, you know, one group will have their audition and then they get off the stage and the next one comes on in. And so now we have next up the Sadducees. Verse 27. Listen to this. Watch how they take center stage with Jesus. Verse 27. Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. Okay, that's all you really need to know about the Sadducees. They say there's no resurrection. Came to Jesus with a question. Teacher. Right? You see how they're all just calling him teacher. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her. And in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? since the seven were married to her. Now let's stop there for a second before we hear Jesus' reply. If you're like me, see, I, I've been studying the Bible carefully for about 30 years. And each time I read this question from the Sadducees, I just stop and I go, what? <laughs> it is crazy. It is absurd. They are raising something from Moses using such an absurd example to try and trap him with a biblical question. So then Jesus replies, verse 34, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise. For he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, Well said, teacher. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. All right, so the Sadducees exit the stage. They also fail. Now see, the main point here is that we see Jesus establish his authority once again because these religious leaders come at him with a question about the Bible, the Bible Jesus read, the Hebrew scriptures. And see, they would have only seen the first five books, the Pentateuch, as authoritative. And they quote from Moses, but Jesus says, okay, you want to play on that turf? Let's do it. And he takes them to Exodus, to the very book, and shows to them that God is the God, not of the dead, but of the living. He calls the Lord the God of Abraham, not the God who was the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But he says that they are alive. He is still their God. He's the God of the living. So yes, there is a resurrection, and Jesus is saying, don't come in with me with the scripture because I have the authority to interpret the scripture and to show you how wrong you are. You see, Jesus gets to show us how we understand the word of God. If you have any questions about that, you can go look at the series we did from uh, several months ago about the book God, had want, God wanted us to have where I talk about Jesus' view of scripture. He has the authority to teach us scripture. He gets the authority to inspire authors and have them write for us what would be kept and preserved through the centuries to where we recognize him as king. And he gets to tell us what to do, to go out and part, be part of his mission in the world as we long for that resurrection one day. We get to be part of his mission. And see, where I want us to end up today now, this, this may be a bit of a jump, but as, I, as I'm looking there with my colored pencils and I'm, I'm marking it up and I'm noticing key words, for the first time, church, in this text, I noticed how in this passage about Caesar and paying taxes to Caesar, 
there's this stuff about a coin, about money. How they don't get it. They're trying to trap him around the issue of money and politics. And then later on, after he condemns them, he indicts them for their injustice. There's this story about some other coins. Namely, the coins that a poor widow who is already poor, and now she becomes utterly destitute because she thinks that in the system, she's got to give away her very last coins. You see, these religious leaders failed to see that this poor widow bears the image of God. And not only are they not caring for her, they are devouring her house and the houses of other widows. C.S. Lewis said in this powerful essay in in the midst of World War II, speaking to students who felt guilty because they were not out there on the front lines of the battle. And they were feeling guilty that they were here in this comfortable space of Oxford or Cambridge or wherever. And he's telling them that, no, you have a place here. And in this powerful essay called The Weight of Glory, He says that there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. You see, when you and I come across another human being, whatever their background, whatever their religion, whatever their story, we're not coming across any ordinary person. You see, the the, the rich people putting seemingly a lot more money, relatively a lot more money into the treasury. They probably never would have noticed this poor widow. She would have seemed even less than ordinary. See, I think in the heart of this passage, it's like Lewis helps us to capture the fact that there are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal because that person who's maybe the the person you're struggling with, that annoying person, maybe the, the boss who's created a toxic environment, maybe your neighbor who is bothering you, maybe someone in your own family with whom you're struggling. Maybe you failed to remember that they bear the image of God. They are never a mere mortal. And so church, what can we do to address ways that we miss the point? We fail to see how people bear the image of God and that has profound implications for how we treat not only each other in the church, but our neighbors in the world outside. See, I look around at the world and I lament, I grieve the way in which Christians feel like they have to hold on to some religious system that's been built up, this man-made religious system. And we hold on to power and think that we've got to maybe align ourselves with the state or the power of politicians to somehow preserve our system and maybe even miss the fact that things that we have built up oppress and marginalize people like this poor widow who thinks she has to take this action when instead we now, the church, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, now we are the temple, are called to address the very thing that would oppress her, that would abuse her. We're called to be the hands and feet of this Jesus the one who comes with the authority of the king, the king who would lay down his life. Our church, he is worth everything. Do you see him in this text? If you've not gotten so far in these, this trilogy of sorts in the temple that we're going to finish next week, that his authority is so worth submitting to because of who he is, why would we not want to bow before this king and worship him? Why would we not want to give him our complete allegiance and follow him as closely as we can every single day? Our church, he is so worth it. Let's pray. Oh Lord, your word is so precious. But Lord, no matter what tradition we grew up in, No matter what habits we've formed in reading your word, maybe we pay lip service to it. Lord, without the work of your Holy Spirit, these are just words on a page. 
words on a screen. So I ask you now, Holy Spirit, to come and sink these words, these truths, these very words of God into our hearts to bear fruit, fruit that will last for your glory and for the joy of people, people like this poor widow. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And now by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you, church.